Welcome, welcome, KHCH 1220 and 98.1 FM with the amazing Ask Brian Radio Show with my co-host, Alex Grossman. Alex, you there? Mr. Brian Johnson, I am here on a lovely Southern California Thursday afternoon. It's perfect. Where else would anyone go at 1 to 2 p.m. on a Thursday afternoon if you're in Los Angeles? But the Ask Brian Radio Show. Did I lose you? <laughs> oh, no. I know it's the place where I spend my time, that's for sure. And what is Ask Brian all about? Well, from listeners who have not, not ever listened to this show, you know, my dad would say, shame on you. But for those listeners that have just tuning in to the Ask Brian radio show, Ask Brian radio is a cohort or an affiliate of the Ask Brian website. Ask Brian is spelled A-S-K-B-R-I-E-N. There's no A-N. It's not a Y-A-N. It's B-R-I-E-N. Why do we do that? Well, to differentiate ourselves. And the Ask Brian website is all about bringing users, business community owners that have business problems, and having them have questions asked and answered by experts, have experts post videos, webinars, blog posts, anything they can do to help a business owner solve their business problem so they do not have to reinvent the wheel. And today we have an amazing guest. He's not even in this country. That's how far away he is coming here to help us and solve all of our business problems. And his name is Eric Tillamundi. Eric, you there? I'm here. I'm excited. It looks like we're going to have fun. And even if I'm living in Canada, currently in Canada, looks like my Thursday from 1 to 2 PST, that big void that I had before, is now filled. This is great news all around. That is awesome. So, now, first of all, have you had your first snowfall? Because you're from Canada. So, here's the thing. Uh, I was in Calgary two days ago. I, I, I've been on the road quite a bit. Uh, I, think, I think I'm looking at 45 flights in 90 days right now. So, I say quite a bit, very seriously. And two days ago, it snowed about eight inches in Calgary, Alberta. So, I'm home happily in Vancouver where there's no snow on the ground. And uh, I can take off my parka here in early October. And maybe jump in the swimming pool. All right, so almost. All right, so you got quite a background, and it, it was so so large I couldn't even, uh, uh, you know, go through all of it. But essentially, essentially, let's go through this, okay? Uh, and let's go through some of the things you've done. First of all, tell everybody what is now innovations, and that's N O capital W. Yeah, it's our differentiator, right? I mean, if we're talking that's Brian with an E, uh, we're also talking Eric with a C. It's we're all about branding, pal. W. It's all about branding. So here's the thing. I mean, we're seeing a huge evolution in work from what we would call the beginning of work to that sort of legacy of work, that transactional sort of nine-to-five experience to this rhetoric around the future of work. And, yeah, we can get our crystal ball out as much as we want and try and predict the future. But I think unless we start planning for the future of work now and understanding the things that we need to do to not just attract and retain talent but create great places to work, the future of work really is something that we're going to miss altogether if we're not going to make it there. So the now of work is really an acronym for the now of work itself. And we're trying to help future-proof companies today so that we can really get ready for the future of work together. So are you referring to remote working or are you referring to just regular working currently done? What do you, what, be a little more specific about that. So here's the thing. I mean, the whole notion of work, I think, is changing right in front of us. I mean, we're living in an exponential time. The World Economic Forum says we've entered the fourth industrial revolution. We're not taking steps forward anymore. We're taking exponential leaps forward. I mean, I was hearing now that the next five years, there will be more innovation and change than there has been in the last 500. Uh, We're seeing even just in terms of data plays and the amount of information out there changing at exponential rates. And so when we look at work, uh, and the future of work, yeah, remote work, flex work is all things that we need to consider, but how we're attracting talent, how we're retaining talent, this whole notion of work, I think, needs to be changing along with just the times that we're doing it, the places that we're doing it, the devices that we're doing it on, and who we're doing work with. Well, one of the things I've noticed in the global economy is you can be working 24 hours a day. Why? Because you could have right. a, three teams. You could have a team, you know, maybe based in Australia, maybe based yep. in, you know, France, and then maybe based in, you know, Hawaii or whatever. I mean, it's it's that ridiculous that you could do it. Plus, I see a, a big in, in issue now, or not an issue, but, you know, foreign languages. So uh, that, mm-hmm. that's a good question, and I don't know if this is even in your 
in your realm of expertise, although you are such an expert in so many different areas, I'm going to ask you that question. So how do you do business if, uh, if you've got uh, a, a team and they're, they're in three different languages? One speaks sure. uh, Croatian, one speaks uh, Swahili, and uh, one oh. speaks French. <laughs> sure. Well, I think, you know, another, if I can add another question before we get to an answer, is like, you know, how do we even define team now? Does team mean they're right. full-time? Does team mean they're contracted? Does team mean they're even on our, our payroll? Are they somebody else's team? I mean, we can go on freelancer or Upwork and still have a team that's working with you uh, around the clock and still not necessarily be a full-time uh, employee. I mean, then what does it look like? What do our town halls look like every quarter? You know, Are these people calling in or are they not part of the team? Are they totally transactional or are they totally ingrained in the culture? And what I've found when it comes to this whole future of work conversation is that there is no right and wrong. There's just true and not true. And I think so many companies are trying to be something that they're not, that the further away we get from who we are, uh, the harder it is to understand and really define what those cultural components are. So, I mean, that, that, that's the question I would add on first. And to, and to answer your question, I would say the artificial intelligence around translation is getting so good now that I actually see that not really being a problem at all. You can translate emails literally on the spot. You can have devices now that will listen to language as it's coming in, translate it on the spot while it's in your ear, and you can respond in that same language uh, just by talking into your phone and having it translate for you. This is real-time stuff now that didn't exist even four or five years ago. I don't want to go too far off point, but I, I do want to ask you this question because when you use the word culture, okay, I'm talking about company culture, and so mm -hmm. that's a very, very good question. How do you create a company culture when you may have freelancers, when you may have people from different countries, different time zones that aren't physically working at the same time on the same project? How do you create a company culture that can be diver diverse enough to handle all time zones, all languages, uh, and different types of workers? Culture is, I mean, like, here's the thing. We've been talking about culture, I'm not going to say for months or years, but, you know, almost decades now, and I think the conversation has evolved to, in my perspective, a frustrating point. Culture, I think, right. is really often misunderstood to be the perks of an organization, like the nap pods and the flex Fridays and, and the ping pong right. tables and the beer kegs of, of the tech world. And that, and that really frustrates me because culture is so much bigger. And I, I really don't want to get fluffy about this whole culture conversation, but culture now, in my opinion, is actually the thing that you do outside of work as well. It's the life that your employment enables you to live, right? It's who you're spending your time with. It's the volunteering that you do. It's the community groups that you're a part of, all influenced by the work that you do. Chances are it influences who you marry. It influences the conversations that you have. It influences your peer and friend groups. Now, I'm not saying it's directly related to or, or is exclusively dictating the life that you live, but it is a bigger factor of, of, of who we are now than it's ever been before, just because of the point you said before. We can be working around the clock. We can be on our devices. We can be stirring the spaghetti pot and being on a conference call at the same time. So to answer your question, I would say that, you know, how do we create a good culture given that we can have a global workforce? Well, I think we first need to understand what good culture is, because a good culture to you might be a toxic culture to me and vice versa. So I think the, right. the biggest thing that we need to understand as business owners is if we're going to create a good culture, first we have to define what good culture is. And if that means that people are very transactional with the work that they do and they check in and they check out and they're not there for a fun environment, they're there to make a paycheck and get the job done, well, fantastic. You can still create a great culture for those people. Now, if you're looking for a Zappos culture where you've got vines hanging from the roof, everyone's got a shake weight, you've got a, you know, a town hall and a rah-rah meeting at 1 o'clock every day, that's fine too. I mean, it's really just about setting that intention. And if we can be clear about the communication as to what makes a good culture and how we can align people with it before they get to the job, that's where I think the secret sauce is. So, Eric, you're a young guy, right? You're a millennial. You're, a, you're an author. You're a speaker. Speak you're, for you're yourself, really, Alex. Really Speak guy. for yourself, Alex. But, He's a young oh, guy. I, I'm sorry, Brian. I realize you're, <laughs> you're a millennial as well, Brian. But, uh, but when we look at this, you know, the culture that you're talking about, and, and I, I took a look at uh, Rethink Work. I, 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 um, I picked up the Kindle edition. It looks like a great book. Um, you know, and a lot of the things you're talking about, modern workplace, what we were – we were calling our, we oldsters were calling it the gig economy just a couple sure. years ago, and that's kind of faded out, right? But, but I mean, I run remote teams. That's all I do today. Uh, virtually, right. you know, because we develop software, we develop hardware, everybody's yeah. remote. Nobody's in the same room. And yeah. my culture isn't really what Brian talked about, which is, 
you know, in, in my case, it's usually Mandarin and uh, in English. But in the culture that we talk about is really the millennial culture. It's really, you know, and you talk about it a little bit, hiring, hiring new people into the workforce, retaining people. You know, when you retain a millennial, they want maybe the vines hanging from the ceiling. They want the shake weight. They want the massage tables. And maybe someone who comes from, say, the, the boomer generation, you know, they want to get in early and they want to leave late. And they, you know, they have a, they have a sense of accomplishment that may be different. So how does someone who's a boomer, which is a lot of our audience, right, how, how does someone who's a boomer get in there and say, I need to really understand these millennials. I need to understand why, you know, how do I retain people? What do I do there? Oh, man. I, I wish this radio show was more than one to two because we could go for hours on, on this topic alone. <laughs> but I, I'm going to ask both of you independently, between what years were a millennial born? Well, Don't theor- Google theoretically. Uh, go, go, no, ahead, go ahead. Nothing uh, on the front. Uh, millennials, I would say probably born between 19... 19- Eighty-eight and ninety-nine. Yeah, it's, for me, it's for me, it's sub thirty-five years old at this point right now. Man, like you guys are talking about half the population. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm not saying I'm not saying you're right or wrong. What I'm saying is that there's no consistency in how we're even defining this group. I mean, how can we possibly generalize and stereotype or stereotype a group that we don't understand? I mean, right now you're talking literally 170 million Americans that all value, want, need, and expect the same thing. And this is exactly my point around this millennial thing. It actually, the research is showing now that there is no correlation between the age of someone and what they value. You can have an introvert or an extrovert who's 15 or 85. You can have someone who values an open office concept who's 22 or 72, who's male or female, who's aboriginal, who's first or sorry who's african-american or who's caucasian and this is what frustrates me so much about the workplace today is that we like to think that younger people value certain things no actually people don't change from generation to generation but the world around them it sure does if we talked 50 well, years ago we grew up and in the he's back also of a talking about generalizations as well i mean yeah I, I i agree with you 100 percent. I, I wouldn't disagree at all with that but what i would what i would say is that you're much more inclined and and, and granted you know both uh, Brian and I come out of a technology background. I mean, we're immersed mm-hmm. in technology all the time, but a lot, of, sure. a lot of boomers don't use technology the way younger people use it, and that's a, a general difference. I think you, I, I listen to uh, some of your videos as well, and you talk about, you know, the phone and, and the whole idea of smartphones. I mean, when I was at Apple, I won't say we invented the smartphone, but we, right. we drove it. And, you know, I was using sure. an iPhone three years before they came out, and I, yeah. it was pretty amazing because we had a Palm Pilot before that, right? So it, it wasn't just, you know, telling you what your schedule was or being able to take notes. You know, you could do everything on it. And today, right. today, you know, younger generations live on that. And, you know, there is, there is something to be said about, you know, people want an upvote and people, people, you know, want to swipe right and swipe left. That's where I so, see the differentiation. So not necessarily by age. Then, yeah, well, that's just it, though. But then how willing to or susceptible to change is an individual? You know, and I think that the line that I heard recently is there's two things people hate, change in the way things are, right? <laughs> and so right, right. Uh, I think that if we were to understand what that experience is prior to getting into the job, if we can articulate what that experience, I mean, and not values. Like, let's get past this integrity, honor, respect conversation. There's nobody who's going to not self-identify as someone who values integrity, honor, and respect. If we can see how that actually shows up, then it's not about trying to attract millennials or males or females or anyone in between. It's about trying to attract the individual that's going to thrive in that environment. Because to your point, there's going to be a lot of people who think Zappos is absolutely toxic. I think what Zappos has done so well is that they've identified the people who will thrive in that environment and they've told that story to those people, right? And so, yeah, is it, is it this next generational conversation, is this a real one? Yeah, yeah, of course it is. But then if I, I just struggle with the with this box that we're putting people in of any generation, for that matter, to say that you know if we do this, then young people will come, and that's just not true. Right, right. Very good point. Very good point. You, you can't make generalizations. I think that's that's the point. I think he's making, and that's the way I see it. Is in any group, you're going to have different people. You could have you can have people that are 85, 90 years old that you know are glued to the iPhone all day, and you may have someone who's 24 who uh, you know has one of the flip phones. You know, so I guess that's the yeah, point. But, I mean, that's just it. I mean, my my grandpa. Sorry about I told the, the iPhone story. That I 
Sorry, you know, <laughs> Alex still has the flip yeah, right. phone, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. I love it. Well, hey, let's just let's just chat about that for a sec because I, I, I've been having conversations with people now who are trying to limit or get off of their cell phone altogether, feeling like they're enslaved to the phone, whether it be email or social or whatever it might be. And it almost seems to me now that it's more of a status symbol to not have the cell phone than it is to have the newest one. A- absolutely. That is a very interesting thing. That I, you, I think, you know, you, you kind of hit this a little bit in your um, in your book when you talk about modern workplaces is that hiring hiring people today. It has almost been if you want to get hired or you want to hire someone, you have to use social tools. You know, you can't use the newspaper anymore. So for someone who's who's wildly successful and doesn't have a cell phone, it is an elite group. And, and okay. I, I can tell you I have some friends that uh, consider themselves above the use of having, having a smartphone or, you know, don't text me. I don't do it. Right. I don't text. Yeah. You know, if sure. you want me, you come see me. And, and that, right. that makes them a lot more elite. And, but, uh, sure. but for the normal person, you just about can't go through life without, without that phone, especially if you're in a higher fire mode, you know, LinkedIn, all these tools that we need sure. to use, right? Facebook yeah. and other and, tools. And, and it's- What's crazy about that is this tool didn't exist 12 years ago, right? Right. Well, I, well Alex may have had, had it 12 years ago. Now. He has an Apple I connection did. here. <laughs> well, you know, here's the funny thing. I was speaking at a conference in uh, in Ontario, uh, up in Canada, in, in, in December, and, and, and the speaker before me brought out this chart, and uh, he was talking about the decline in work hours from 1980 to 2000. And, uh, you know, the decline in work hours was actually quite significant. I don't want to pull out any direct numbers, but it was something like 25%. And uh, I thought that was fascinating because I'm sitting at the back of the room with my 4G LTE smartphone and Googling what was the technology that came out in the year 2000. It turns out that in 1998, we'll remember that the, that the Palm Pilot came out. <laughs> so I'm sitting at the back of the room saying, what was the capacity of the Palm Pilot. Sure enough, it said 512 kilobytes. And I'm looking at my 524 gigabyte iPhone thinking like this thing literally has 1,048,000 times the space that this Palm Pilot did. And so really, when we talk about this, if I can just go one step deeper, if we're talking about this talent attraction, workplace culture optimization conversation, which is one I like to have not on a daily, more on like an hourly basis, is that like the world that we're living in today and how we communicate and how we get information and how much information is out there is changing so exponentially fast that I think we've got this paradox of choice, right? We can go on LinkedIn or Monster or Upwork or Freelancer or the job boards or the university pages and find literally hundreds of thousands of jobs, not just in our backyard, but globally. And I think that when we look at the job description today, it's this one-page BS document that doesn't say anything other than the skills and requirements needed to do the job. By the way, there are 80,000 jobs that look exactly like that, where if you printed out these pages, held them up to a bright enough light, you could see right through all the white space because they look (laughs) identical. And we wonder why 10 years shorter than it's ever been before. We wonder why nobody's happy at work. Because what's happening is people are printing out these one-page documents, applying to 70 jobs, rolling the dice until they get it right to the point now where research is suggesting that people who are graduating high school now are going to have 13 jobs by the time they're 40. And if you can hold that thought, we're going to be right back on KHS 1220 and 98.1 FM. We'll be right back. The city of Santa Clarita has so much going on this year. Be on the lookout for amazing events happening throughout the year, including the Cowboy Festival, concerts in the park, Thursdays at Newhall, and the Santa Clarita Marathon. There are also a number of fun activities and things to do year-round, including outdoor recreation, hiking and bike trails, adult classes, art exhibits, youth sports programs, and more. You can even sign up to be a volunteer. Learn more at santa-clarita.com. There's nothing like a handmade, original, created with passion from the heart. Celebrating all things unique, the Harvest Festival Original Art and Craft Show at the Ventura County Fairgrounds, Friday through Sunday, October 5th through 7th. Shop over 24,000 original works from hundreds of artists. Enjoy live entertainment, a kid's zone, and pumpkin patch, strolling performers, contests, specialty foods, demonstrations, and more. Visit HarvestFestival.com or call 925-392-7300. 
Little Eye Leaders is the newest preschool in the Santa Clarita Valley. At Little Eye Leaders, our outstanding teachers lead with intellect, perspective, and heart. That means our programs provide a warm, nurturing atmosphere to meet the unique needs of each child. We believe that play is a powerful form of learning for young children. That's why our kids have every opportunity to learn through the magic and excitement of play. Parents, schedule a tour today by calling 303-0400 or online at littleeyeleaders.org. Do you think taxpayers should pay for politicians' political campaigns? Assembly candidate Christy Smith does. Christy Smith supports raising our taxes. But guess where the money would go? Christy Smith wants to spend as much as $600 million in taxpayer money paying for the annoying mail and TV that politicians bombard us with. Let that sink in. Assembly candidate Christy Smith wants you to pay for political campaigns, even for those politicians you disagree with. Let that sink in. Christy Smith would spend $600 million for politicians instead of better roads or better schools for our kids. Christy Smith is just wrong. Women deserve equal pay for equal work. It's just that simple. That's what's good about Assemblyman Dante Acosta. Dante Acosta voted to require equal pay for equal work. And Dante Acosta voted to let every child attend pre-kindergarten. That's Dante Acosta. Bipartisan. Independent. Fair. Paid for by Dante Acosta for Assembly 2018. KHTS. Now FM, 98.1 FM and AM 1220, your hometown station. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're here with my co-host. Alex Grossman and my established, amazing, awesome guest, Eric Mundi, on the Ask Brian Radio Show. Every week, Thursday, 1 to 2 p.m. If you're not here, you're out of it. Okay, we were just talking about, what were we talking about the last conversation we had? Sorry about that, guys. I apologize. That We were talking about in the first half of the show about the differentiations about different groups and different cultures that you cannot uh, define any one person, no matter their age or no matter what their background is, in any one specific group. That was a summary that I got. Now, if I'm way off base, go ahead, please tell me. If I'm not, let's continue. Eric? Well, I think, I think where we were ending to is kind of around that, that job description, you know, being that sort of one-page skills and requirements document. You know, the fact that people are having so many jobs by the time they're, I don't know, 40, 30, whatever. The fact that tenure is shorter than it's ever been, that job dissatisfaction is incredibly high. We've got psychological safety issues in the workplace. Really, the notion of work is at a critical point right now that I think needs to be changed. Do you think it's easier or harder to get a job now than it was 20 years ago, forgetting about economic status uh, situations? Well... I can't really speak to trying to apply for a job 20 years ago. I was. We'll I was have to sick. ask Alex. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's. Uh, I think it's interesting though. The uh, when you, when you look at that and you're looking at getting a job or, or hiring someone, you know that the skills and the requirements and the dissatisfaction happens on both ends, right? So if you sure. don't have long tenure at your job, it costs the company money. So I mean, if you're you know, Brian will use this, uh, use this uh, furniture store description all the time. I mean, if you hire someone as, say, an accountant in your furniture store and they leave after a year, it, you know, you could be in trouble. You, you have, you know, the books aren't right or something's wrong or, you know, you got an IRS audit or something like that. You, you really want someone that knows the business and can help out and will stay 5, 10, 20 years or retire there. But, you, but that's harder to do. It's hard on both people. It's hard on the person who gets upset because the job wasn't right for them, but it's just as hard for the business owner who says, I, you know, I wish I had an employee that I could count on, you know, 100% to be here for the next 20 years. Mm-hmm. Well, here, here's what I'll say to that. I mean, right now, the biggest questions that I'm getting all over the map are, are how do we attract this next generation of talent? I mean, even if, if my numbers are right, maybe we can do a quick fact check. I think there are 1.36 million accountants in America right now. And... Uh, <laughs> 
That's right. I'm glad you said accountant as the example. Um, but you could be an accountant at a furniture store or a golf club, or you could be at Deloitte or PwC or your municipality down the road or Starbucks. You know, very often if you've got your CPA designation, your job is going to be very similar. But the way that you live your life as a result of the job and what you value and who you are is going to change drastically from that golf course accountant to the accountant that's working for the municipality, the accountant that's working for Deloitte, right? And so where I'm going with right. this, too, is that unless we're telling that story that's bigger than just what happens in the 9 to 5 that includes the experience while you're on the job and what's it's going to look and feel like and the life that you're going to be able to live as a result of the job, then we can't expect to keep anyone for very long, regardless of what their age is, if we don't tell that story. And so I just think it's really important to be proactive in this conversation to say it's not just what are your skills and requirements, but what is the life going to be like as a result of this job? Who are you working with? Is it open office concept or closed? How often do you meet with your superior? Is there a dog running around in the office? Because if there is and you're allergic, well, you don't want to move across the country to take that job either, right? I mean, there are so many right. things that we need to be asking that we're not now that doesn't cost the company any money and it doesn't require them to change and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't actually um, prohibit them from doing anything that they could have done before. It actually just enables the opportunity to be that, to be that much greater. Yeah, and so, Eric, you mentioned something as well. You, you, when we were talking uh, before during the break, you said that, you know, all these resumes look identical. You could, you could hold them up to the, to the light and look through them all, and they're, they're all identical, and people need to, need to do that. So. Isn't it a little like dating? You know, a, a job interview is always is always a little like a date. A lot more yeah. is going to come out in there, but people don't always know what to ask when they when they when they get there. And a lot of job interviews today, I've done this myself. I mean, we use Upwork sure. all the time, right? Those job yeah. interviews are over text, uh, yeah. you know, and um, and I expect them to be a team. In the first conference call or video call we have, you know, I meet someone who's not the person that I was texting with, right? So sure. it's a different. Um, different environments. So what, what advice do you give to people to help them ask those right questions, do those right things on both sides? Cool, man, I would say the, the, the fastest way to speed up human connection is to slow down. And we're living in this hyperspeed world right now that was, I would almost argue, is autopilot. <laughs> you know, we're just doing so many things so often that I think we almost like lose consciousness in the decision making that we're doing. Like if it checks the boxes, yes, move on. We got stuff to do. I mean, we're all busy. I get that. And the more we can take the time on the front end to understand if this person is going to be a good fit for organization and allow them to understand if they're going to be a good fit too. You know, it's kind of a dream of mine where people treat organizational culture as if it's a bit, a bit like cilantro or black licorice or pineapple on pizza. And for me, that's a hard no across the board. But I'd love to know that prior to going into the job. And right now, there's not enough information for either party to understand if that's going to be true or not. And so if we can front load this application process to not just, you know, I'm not saying go out for beers and coffees for three weeks, don't bring them into the office and job shadow for two months. Like, that's not efficient either. What I am saying is start telling the stories of your existing employees that are your A players. Understand both what they love about the organization in terms of what it has and in terms of what it doesn't have. Because very often the things that we aren't in terms of our company and our culture are the things that make us what we are. They're our differentiators. They're the things that, that make us stand out. And if we're talking about 1.36 million accountants, it's going to be the things that these firms and these offices aren't that are going to really set them apart. And, and Eric, you know that okay. I'm an accountant and a lawyer, right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> So I'm, the, I'm one of the 1.36 million. <laughs> hey, but I mean, and you should jack it for less money with your requirements. No yeah, one should sure. be able to speak better to this than you, right? I mean, you can do the same job in a, in a, in a numerous different offices and know that there are going to be places that you love and places that you hate, not because of what you do, but because of how, why, and who you do it with. Well, that, that's definitely true. And I also think that, um, uh, you know, when you're doing accounting, whether or not you're doing it for the furniture store or the high-tech company, uh, the same rules apply. So, I mean, n you may have to uh, look at different areas of the law or d different areas of accounting to understand that, but the same areas do come up. People think that, well, you know, you don't need the same person for a lawyer, uh, for, you know, Apple computer versus uh, being the accountant at, uh, at the furniture store. But the reality is the training and background and the skills – uh, they're not that different. They're not that different. And so if you can handle one job, you probably can handle the other, which uh, then goes into play, which is 
the more important factor other than status and experience really is does that person fit into your company culture and if that person fits into your culture it doesn't matter whether you're apple or the furniture store you're going to work out and if you don't you don't it doesn't matter what your background is or that that extra extra added stuff i, I would make a bit of a bold perhaps polarizing statement i actually think that what we do is incredibly overrated um, I think that the whole advice around go find your follow your passion is the best intended worst advice that we could be given. Because, of course, we want to find our passion. But I think what happens when we try and find our passion or follow our passion, that uh, we end up chasing happiness our whole lives instead of realizing that we've probably got it right in front of us. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating against growth or learning or development or anything along those lines. But instead of trying to find or follow our passion, I would say try and follow or find the things that make us feel passionate. And whether you're a lawyer or an accountant or in sales or in business development, I, it doesn't matter to me. You could do one of 10,000 different jobs and still find that same fulfillment and purpose and impact and value all those 2018 buzzwords that we're hearing in a totally different position. I think more important is the environment that you can thrive in while you're doing this. And if we can find those things that make us feel passionate as opposed to that one unicorn that we keep chasing to our grave, uh, only then right. will we start to realize that we've got happiness all around us and we stop trying to chase that thing that might not even exist. Well, this, this well, I, I think like the Eric, pursuit of happiness. Yeah. Well, well I, th I, th I think, Eric, from, from my past experience as well and, you know, being that boomer generation, we, uh, unlike, unlike what they're saying today and, you know, all those buzzwords that they put out today, it was mainly, you know, when I had, a, uh, I, I had advisors, you know, even as far back as high school but in college, when you're looking at what class you're going to take, it was really mm -hmm. related to, I mean, I, I, I took classes to be an electrical engineer. Was I mm -hmm. extremely passionate about it? Yeah, I was lucky. But many of the sure. people that I went to school with dropped out or changed their major because in those days there was a shortage of electrical engineers. You know, the, the, yeah. the government forecasted that within the next four years we're going to need 100,000 electrical engineers. And Everybody took it as a major, and the other reason is you could make a lot of money in it. But unfortunately, a lot of people did it for that, not because it's passion. So I think universities, I think high schools, um, you know, and parents as well have turned around and said, well, you know, follow your passion, follow your dreams, chase your dreams. And, but, but to your point, sometimes those dreams are a little misguided. They're not always, well, your dream is to go down, you know, work at Google so you can go down the 200-foot uh, slide in the building, right? That may not be the dream you want to chase and other people want to chase that dream to say, you know, I want to make a million dollars a year. So, sure. um, you know, the, the, the dreams have to be real. And I think people, I think people understand that. I, I want to mention one more thing on that because I, I, it leads me to something that I really wanted to talk about, which is most of our audience or a vast majority of our audience, they're small business owners. And the reason they're sure. small business owners is because they work for someone else and maybe didn't have that dream. And so they broke mm -hmm. out, to get their own dream and and some are dissatisfied possibly and a lot are satisfied but when they hire people they want to hire like minds who do this who do the same thing but it's a little different and i've been in this position when you're the ceo of a company even if it's small versus you're one of the workers right so how, how do you how do you get people to to rationalize that as well to know where they want to go well, I mean, the first thing I'll say is I, I, I think you, if you're a small business, you do want somebody who's aligned, yes. But I think more importantly, you want someone who's complementary. <laughs> I mean, if you've got two people right. that can do the same job and value the same things, you're going to be stepping on each other's toes right from day one. <laughs> it's pretty wild. Right. Um, I would also, you know, invite people to consider that 65% of today's 12-year-olds will have jobs that don't exist yet, right? So, like, this whole innovation thing is really real. And when I'm looking at these future of jobs reports, a big one came out of uh, Royal Bank of Canada um, here north of the border. And when they look at future job trends, we've actually, what they've done is they've stripped job titles all together, and then they've grouped them into categories, doers, crafters, technicians, facilitators, providers, and solvers. And so because the world around us is moving so fast, we're going to see so much disruption I mean, AT&T right now has just committed a billion dollars to reskilling their workforce, 100,000 people. You know what they're training them in? Active listening, critical thinking, empathy, compassion, composure, creativity, all of these soft skills. Because what's going to happen is we're going to have to change and pivot so fast 
that it's not even the title that's going to matter so much as it is the action and the task that we do. We're going to have and already do have so many transferable skills that this whole passion and dream conversation I think is is almost comical because, yes, these dreams are real, but it's not just one. That's like saying that everyone's pursuing the same American dream, the white picket fence, the house, the car, the two kids, maybe even a cat and a goldfish. And that's fine. We've been led to believe that that's the American dream that everyone wants. It's not about that one American dream. It's about the American's dream. And if that's true, then there's 326 million different jobs that we could be working towards or different lifestyles that we can be working towards. And I think it's these behavior sets and these patterns that we need to be looking for and recruiting for, knowing that change is going to be the only constant moving forward from today on. When you have many different skills and many different... uh... Uh, you know, w- w- where you can cross train and, and go into many different jobs. Doesn't that affect you in terms of how far you're going to go in your career? Because you're, you're you're focusing on so many multitasking that you're not really focusing on that one area and everybody's looking for that niche area to be successful, to be the expert, to really know and become found as an expert? Wow. I mean, w- <laughs> Yeah, very good point. And one of the best lines that that I heard is that you don't you don't have to know how to drive a car to be the you know the, the president of GM. You need to know how to manage the people that know how to drive the cars. So I think that yes, these 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 specialists are incredibly important, and those who are specializing in something will do very well. It's also those generalists who have those soft deep people skills that can work both with technology and people that I think will will do very well, too, from a leadership perspective. Keep in mind, a lot of these specialists don't want leadership roles. Sometimes the biggest shot in the foot is a promotion. Uh, so, again, I think it's sure. really about understanding who we are and the environment that we can thrive in and do really well in and just be really intentional about pursuing that, uh, that I think will get us furthest regardless of who we are. Yeah, Eric, I can tell you that's, a, that's a, an incredibly good point because in tech companies, it very, very often in tech companies, you get a really good technical leader. Um, you know, they, they come up the ranks. They might even come to a CTO role, but they're always a visionary thinking about where it's going to be. First thing they do is they jump off, become the CEO of a, of a startup. They get funded because they, they you know, they have, the, they have the, the skills, but then they run the thing in the ground because they don't understand the other components of how to run it. I mean, it's, I think okay. it's important for, to be the CEO of, of GM, General Motors. You, you should probably like cars or at least, at least drive one. Um, uh-huh. Don't take the bus to work you know, or, or have right. a limo yeah. drive you in, but you, you don't have to be, you don't have to be, uh, you know, Mario Andretti. Um, exactly. you know, you don't have to be a race car driver. Right. But, uh-huh. but there's, um, there's something to be said for that. And I think that advice in, in its own helps a lot of people really understand and, and, and put things in perspective as to where, where they need to go with, uh, with some of their decisions, both, both hiring, firing and, and, uh, in secondary jobs. So I think that's great. You know, an interesting yeah. comment off topic, but not totally off topic, is you're talking about you're 18 years old, you decide you go to college, you have to declare a major, you're 19, 20 years old. How do you know what your passion is at that age? I mean, you, you know, you may have played beer pong and, uh, you know, had a couple of things here and there and done well in a couple of classes, but just because you do, you're successful in those classes and it's successful, you know, in the dorm area doesn't mean that, uh, that whether or not you have the passion for that area. So I find it very interesting that people are at such a young age have to define what they're going to be. I know they're grown up, but what they, you know, what their passion is until you've actually gone through and done something in that area, like an apprentice or some, or had a job for a year or two, you don't know if that's your passion. And so I, I'm, I'm interested to hear the comments from both of you on how you think about that. What, you know, at such a young age, you have to make that decision. Uh, how do you know what your passion is at that such a young age? I'll take a quick stab at that. Uh, you don't. And I think, again, in this world, it's busier and more noisy than it's ever been before. This conversation is going to be more and more serious than it was in decades past. And if anyone uh, were to go to school today, um, I would tell them to take a liberal arts degree. I think the liberal arts degree is going to be thriving. I think that's really one of the only degrees in a university that's going to be doing really well. There will be lots of technical and special um, programs that people can take, no doubt. Uh, But I think it's those who've got the ability to assess the world around them and make decisions, solve problems, be creative, and and tackle something that is increasingly misunderstood. That is the world that we live in. 
uh, that is where I think the most successful people that are coming out of university will be uh, and what education they'll have. Well, from the electrical engineer, what does he think? Well, it's very interesting because, of course, electrical engineer, I come from the other side of that, right? I make things. Yeah. I build things. You know, I don't, I don't need the philosophy piece if there's enough philosophers in the world, right? I'm kind of kidding a little bit, but the truth of the matter is, you know, there's, an, there's enough artists and philosophers, and, you know, someone's got to make the money and build the stuff, and if it wasn't for us, you wouldn't have the technology you have. But that being said, the other, the other side of it is, and, and Eric, you might, you know, again, you have a very millennial view of a couple different things. In 1970, a gentleman by the name of Alvin Toffler wrote a book called Future Shock that you should probably read if you haven't, because a lot of the ideas that are in that book are ideas that you're saying today that he saw in 1970, the idea right. that things were going to be super fast and move quickly. And he predicted many of the things that we see today from a societal standpoint. You know, he predicted, you know, a lot of people with a lot of tattoos and different color hair and crazy clothes and just, you know, the hypersensitivity that we have today in, in the world and this, this big change in, in you know, gender fluid, fluidity and other pieces. Sure. That a lot of this stuff, you know, isn't new. And I think that one of the, the millennial pieces is that, hey, it's all new and we have to change culture. And the only way we can change culture is to get a liberal arts degree because, hey, that's what changes culture. So I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying sure. that, in that in that sense of it, it's, you know, crystal balls usually are wrong. Hey, listen, guys. The magic eight ball. Alex, we have to go to a break, so we're going to have to hold off right now. KHCS 1220 and 98.1 FM. Santa Clarita Philharmonic has begun its season of free concerts. The SCP is a nonprofit community based volunteer symphony orchestra comprised of local musicians from throughout the Santa Clarita Valley who are dedicated to providing quality classical music for the residents of the Santa Clarita Valley. Like the Santa Clarita Philharmonic on Facebook or visit SantaClaritaPhilharmonic.org for more information. The VIP Grotto Experience at the Ivy Day Spa. Your experience begins with a clay facial mask. Then you are painted with a soothing aloe vera shea butter coconut oil body mask. In temperatured chambers, you relax and allow the moisturizing masks to work their magic. Finally, you rinse off in a rainforest shower and finish with a pH balancing mist. Treat yourself to this hydrating and refreshing experience at the Ivy Day Spa. Call to reserve your VIP Grotto Experience at 260-1244. What's the perfect way to end the weekend? Sunday brunch at Salt Creek Grill, of course. Wind down with delectable dishes off Salt Creek's award-winning menu and enjoy a glass of champagne, because after all, you deserve it. Make Sunday brunch at Salt Creek Grill a new tradition with your family and friends. Salt Creek Grill in Valencia on Town Center Drive in front of the movie theater. For reservations, 222-9999 or go online to saltcreekgrill.com. I've always been driven to serve our country and our community. Congressman Steve Knight. I served in the United States Army and spent 18 years as an officer with the Los Angeles Police Department. I ran for Congress because too often I saw people forgotten by Washington. The crisis at the VA exemplified a bureaucracy that was out of touch and hurting real people. As your congressman, I'm committed to making our government in Washington work better for you. My name is David Brayton. I am an Air Force veteran. Ten years ago, my doctors told me that I had to have a double lung transplant. It was a massive uphill battle to get the VA to do what they said they were going to do in the first place. Finally, Steve Knight got involved, and if it wasn't for Steve Knight's assistance in this thing, I guarantee you I'd be dead. Steve Knight is a veteran, and he's LAPD on top of it. I'm voting for Steve Knight because he gets stuff done for us. I'm Steve Knight, and I approve this message. KHTS AM 1220 and the new 98.1 FM. Welcome back with the Ask Brian Radio Show with my co-host, Alex Grossman and our amazing special guest, Eric Tomonde. Are you there, guys? 
I'm here, and I got to dig myself out of this hole that I put myself in before we went to break. Well, that's because you're so <laughs> passionate about digging. Oh, man. Okay, well, let me, let me just grab that shovel again. The question that I heard before we went to break was, what should a 17- or 18-year-old do uh, if they have no idea, you know, what their passion is or what they want to do. And, and I replied with a very millennial-esque answer, go learn how to solve problems and be a philosopher. And uh, I, I, I'm just going to clarify that, yes, I still believe the computer scientists, the engineers are the ones that are building the planet and, and will be for not just years, decades to come for the foreseeable future. Uh, Until aliens land. Think yeah, right. So if I think if, if someone is 17 or 18 and they've got their Thursday from 1 to 2 p.m. PST slot filled by the, by the show here and, and they're clueless, I would say, yes, I would still st stand by what I said in, in looking at that liberal arts degree, but also learn how to code, get those programs, get those, get those skills, those hard skills locked down as well. Uh, that won't go to waste, uh, you know, but that said, if you do know the direction that you want to go and you're looking for that hard skill, go get it for sure. And don't look at, don't look at a psychology degree. <laughs> <laughs> now, Eric, we only, have a few, we only have a few minutes here and I'm, I'm hoping we're going to get you back as a guest because this has been very, very good. But um, I, I, I think, I think you're hundred percent right. I, I, I think where you're, where you're going with this and what you're saying is great, but tell me this. You're a young guy. You're just out of, out of college a few years. When did you know, when did you have the passion? When did you know this is what you wanted to do? Man, I don't. I'm just figuring it out like everyone else. Uh, I'm just being, trying to be a little bit more bold and, and, and loud about it than, than most, I think. You know, and I get people to tell me I'm wrong and an idiot all the time, and that's really how I'm learning. Um, I love this conversation. I like these non-conclusive conversations that can go until the sun sets and then rises again the next morning where, you know, yes, we're pulling out the crystal ball, but I think there's some, you know, some, something we're building on here that some people, that, that people can take away from. And, uh, I love this discovery process that I get to share with my world, with my network. And I, I like being told that I'm wrong so that I can be a little bit more right next time. And this is just a lifelong learning process that I'm going through and in trying to enjoy every step along the way. So, Eric, putting you on the spot, three, thing, okay. three things that somebody would want to know about to determine. So they're trying to figure out what is their passion. They don't know what their passion is. What are the three things, three tips that you could give that person to figure out what their passion is or how to find out what it is? Uh, number one, stop looking for that one passion. Like there's only one that exists. Know that there's a hundred things that you could do right now and today that'll put a smile on your face. And and I think that if Sounds we can like start dating. to narrow, <laughs> isn't it though? <laughs> Anyone open Tinder or Bumble in the last five years? Like, yeah, that's kind of exactly what it's like. But again, the problem with Tinder and Bumble is you look at this picture, like you get a full description as to who the individual is. Kind of sounds like a job description to me, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, so there's just not enough information out there for us to make educated decisions. So like the two of you said, go out there and get experience. It's not necessarily maybe about finding what you like, find out what you don't like. So you can cross that off the list. See if you're a thinker, a solver, a doer, if you're a, a, a crafter, if you're a technician, if you're a facilitator, see how you like to go about doing that work and know that there are going to be tens of thousands of opportunities in each of those pockets to go do what you like to do. I don't think that you're looking for a title anymore. I think you're looking for um, a style. I think you're looking for a way to do what you're good at doing. Uh, and so, you know, we talked about remote and flex work. We talked about nine to five. We talked about different cultures. Find people who you admire that love the experience that they're going through and have a similar skill set that you do too. I mean, I'm not breaking this down into point one, point two, point three, but just, just be endlessly curious and empathetic and hungry about this discovery process and know that you're going to find it a lot faster. And what you find might be something totally different than what you're looking for. That's why Alex almost yeah. became a basket weaver. <laughs> hey, there I, you I, go. I do underwater basket weaving and I'm pretty good at it. All right. <laughs> but, but I think that's, I think that's really good advice for that. I, I think people, people often will change, will change their careers in the middle of their career and find their passion and find what they do best. Because I think the thing you hit on is that talent is, is just as important. Um, but Brian and I know someone who went to school for accounting and he became a graphic artist because sure. he happened to have the talent to do it. Well, guys, and, uh, I, hate to do that, I hate to do this too. Do. 
I have to cut everybody off, but my uh, engineer is screaming at me. Get off the show. We got to go. We got to go. That's how my engineer talks. Cody. How do they get a hold of Eric? LinkedIn. Eric, Eric Tur Monday, I guess we decided. It'll so be on, find me on there. <laughs> connect, we decided. And, uh, we'll, go, we'll go from there. It'll be on, it'll be on our Fantastic. website. You can find out all the contact information, how to buy his book. KHS 1220 and 98.1 FM with Alex Grossman and Bye-bye. Eric Tur Monday. The best live theater can be found right here in the Santa Clarita Valley. The can-